Okay, here we are going through Matthew chapter 12, and to help kick this off, I started doing a little bit of research on some really dumb ideas that people tried using either to campaign or dumb ideas people use that they wanted other people to campaign for for them. And so I went through looking at all these different inventions because there's these websites like GoFundMe and crowdfunding and all these type of sites that people can kind of campaign for your dollars that they could invent stupid things. And they have there's just so many things that are out there. And I first started looking at just campaign strategies. And I was looking at history trying to find out how have people tried to get other people on their side? How have they tried to convince them to support their ideas? to support their candidacy or to support their invention? How have they tried to lure people in with that? And in 1964, so some of you are going to not have even been born yet or even thought about. Some of you, this is your adult years. <laughs> some of you, you might even remember this like it was yesterday that uh, we had Lyndon Johnson versus Gear Barry Goldwater for the presidency. Okay, and so uh, Goldwater, when he was trying to run for president of the United States, had this great slogan that he used to try to rally people up onto his side. And his slogan was, Goldwater, in your heart, you know he's right. And people seemed to appreciate that until it backfired. Backfired in a way he could never have anticipated because then Lyndon Johnson came up with something a little bit different. He took that phrase and he said, Goldwater, in your guts you know he's nuts. <laughs> True story. Ended up resulting in one of the largest presidential landslides in our country's history just amazing but it doesn't stop there there are so many people that have tried to get people on their side to vote for them or to support them and to fund them and of these great things that have come off of gofundme.com and a few others are stuff like the pizza fork I kid you not. <laughs> I did, however, find you can buy these for $4.99, but they come with a whole lot of complaints as far as people like slicing their finger with the pizza slicer and also hitting themselves in the chin with the slicer when they're feeding themselves. And so that's just kind of a, I wouldn't recommend this particular product to you, but maybe you'd be more interested in the fork chops. <laughs> okay, the fork chops, or maybe the car exhaust grill, okay, because you just know that this has got to be some yummy burgers right here. And don't worry, I investigated very carefully. No, the exhaust does not touch the food. There is actually a pipe that runs through the lid that's where the exhaust goes, and it's the heat of the exhaust that cooks the burger. So now are you willing to try it? Anybody, takers, want to give it a shot? If I told you I had one, I'd hook it up to your car and cook your supper on it. Would you take it? Yeah, no, but I didn't think so. I wasn't too big on that either. But I did like this one. Hand or pants? Underwear for your hands. Yeah, I bought me a pair. I could not resist that. Just no absolute way. Could I? I mean, it's tidy whities for your hands, man. I'm talking about, I mean, check how amazing is that one size fits all for tidy whities. Look at that. I feel like my hands have so much comfort and support now. <laughs> Never have my hands been more comfortable in all my life than wearing these little puppies. Isn't that great? <laughs> oh, come on. That's brilliant stuff there. See, they got me on board just with the phrase hander pants. I was done. I was like, hander pants, underwear for your hands, really? I showed it to my wife and she went, oh, we're buying those. <laughs> we went on Amazon right then and there and bought a pair. It was no hesitation required. We were hooked. And then one last one here, toilet golf. I'm setting this up in the bathroom right after service. I'm not joking. <laughs> if anybody's got to use the restroom, the one right off here, the sanctuary, starting tonight, will have miniature golf for you to be able to play while sitting on the throne. Isn't that awesome? Hey, it's the advancement of the church, right? Here it is. <laughs> 
It's just the craziest stuff. It's amazing what people will campaign for. The ideas they come up with. It is amazing that people will actually fund this stuff. That they will look at these websites, these crowdfunding sites, and they will actually say, yes, I will give you $1,000 to go to a factory and make those. Just send me a pair, please. It's amazing what people will do for some of these crazy inventions. Yes, I'm wearing these the rest of today. Some of you are like, you still got those on. I'm telling you, it's the best support. It's so great. Okay, it's amazing what people will do. But here's the thing about Jesus. He is not campaigning. He is not campaigning. But the religious leaders and the Pharisees are trying to treat him like he's campaigning. So they keep asking him questions. Why don't you support this trade? Why don't you support that? What's your view on this? What's your view on that? Why don't you show us why we should follow you as if Jesus was somehow running for the position of God? As if he was somehow campaigning to be Messiah and trying to beat out all the competitors. And here's just the reality of it. Jesus is not campaigning. He already won that vote. It was one vote out of one. It was a landslide victory. Jesus wins. He's God. He's the Messiah. The end. Okay, but somehow, even today, people treat him like he's campaigning. They keep saying, well, if Jesus is God, then why? Well, if Jesus is really God, then explain to me that. Or if God really is as you say he is, then why is this taking place or that taking place? As if somehow God has to defend himself for our vote. And our vote doesn't matter because he is God, period. But nevertheless, that's why the people struggled then. That's how they struggle today. People struggle today with this exact same thing, thinking that somehow Jesus has to persuade them for their vote. And so I thought that because that's how our world is, I'm going to take Jesus' words, Jesus' defense, Jesus' life, and be able to provide for you something amazing to guarantee, prove that he is God, that Jesus is the Messiah, beyond any shadow of a doubt, so that we can get this campaign stuff out of our heads and move forward with the kingdom of God. Doesn't that sound awesome? Okay, like three people are like, Awesome. Other people are like, wait, prove Jesus is really? People have been trying that for decades and centuries. You're just going to do it here in this church? Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's the challenge for today. And I love how Jesus deals with this whole issue. Because the Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, give us a sign. Give us a sign. And that sign is a twofold desire. One, Jesus, show us proof that you are God. And two, Jesus, provide us comfort in knowing that if we follow you, things will turn out all right in the end. By providing for me A or B, then, then I will do C or D for you. So God, answer this prayer to my favorability the way I want it answered. Then, then I'll be serious for you. Then, then I'll follow you. Then, then I'll understand understand that you're God and I'll commit my life to you. But if you don't answer in this way, this issue, then forget it. You're not the God that I want. Okay. And so that's how people usually try to treat Jesus. They treat their prayers. They treat their issues regarding Jesus. And that's how the Pharisees do it. So check this out. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Jesus, teacher, we want to see a sign from you. Prove to us you are God. Show us you are worth following. Show us a sign. So Jesus answered, I love this, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. In other words, Jesus is saying, I don't need to prove myself to no one, especially you. Okay, it basically saying, hey, I'm the creator, you're the created, why should the clock ask the clockmaker if he's a clockmaker? Why should that even take place? How wicked is that? How selfish is that? That's Jesus' initial reply. But, he gives a but. You know what buts do, right? Besides shake. Buts remove what was previously there before and offers a different option. Okay, offers a different option. So Jesus says, you know what? Only wicked people desire a sign, but I'll tell you what. Because it's already clear that the Pharisees are wicked, so... It's just kind of pot, just saying, hey, you, you, your pot's black. Look at that. Woo -hoo. Okay, it's just obvious. But he says, you know what? I'll tell you what. Nothing is going to be given. 
None is going to be given, no sign for this generation at all, except, oh, ooh, Jesus does offer one sign. He offers one. He says, except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's the sign that Jesus offers there. And it's kind of a little bit cryptic. It's a little bit cryptic. So it might be a, not a bad idea to kind of back up and look at who this Jonah was. Because Jonah is a really odd duck. He was actually a jerk. Okay, Jonah was not a nice guy. He is not someone we should base our lives upon. Jonah was a jerk. Jonah was a guy that God came to and told Jonah, hey, Jonah, see, the, see Nineveh over there? That city is so full of wickedness. That city is so full of sinners. They need to hear about God and his judgment so that they will repent and turn to God so that they can find forgiveness. And Jonah hated, hated Okay, he hated Nineveh. He, he viewed Nineveh the way IU views, or the way Indiana University views Purdue University. Okay, he just hated them. He wanted nothing to do with them. And he knew, he knew that they needed a loving and forgiving God. He knew that's who God was. And so Jonah ran the other direction, wanted nothing to do with Nineveh. So God had, uh, put, Jonah got onto a boat and he went off to sea. God had a big storm come and attack the boat. It's shaking and rocking. The, uh, the pagan people who were right, driving the boat or sailing the boat, boat were all confused they're like what's going on what god did we offend who on earth did we tick off that's causing all this quick let's throw dice on the ground and see if we can figure this out so they started casting lots kind of like throwing dice down to figure out if they can get yahtzee and see who on earth this god is and so then jonah comes upstairs and he says hey guys it's me it's my fault i ticked the real god and now he's after me and so they said cool and they made him walk the plank and so he gets thrown off the boat into the water a giant fish swallows him up the storm stops there he is in the belly of this fish for three days and three nights and apparently uh after but after those days jonah decided to pray to god and this is where we've discovered that the fish was actually a, a pagan fish because prayer made him sick and so after getting sick from Jonah's prayer, the fish barfed Jonah up onto the lake, onto the land. And so Jonah went to Nineveh and he just kind of walks in. He looks around and he sees all these people. You know, they're smacking each other with fishes. They're just being all kinds of crazy, right? And so they're just, just sinful all over the place. They actually are celebrating boy bands. They're wearing turtleneck sweaters. It's just a real mess of a city. Okay, just absolute mess. And they're all driving Priuses. I mean, they just don't know what's going up. Okay, so they have a lot of repenting to do. Okay, and so there's, that's what they're doing. So Jonah walks through the city, and he just kind of muddles under his breath. He just goes, God's judgment is going to come upon this city if we don't repent. A guy walks by and goes, what? What did you just say? And Jonah goes, oh, no. Oh, no. God didn't say I have to repeat it. And the guy goes, I know exactly what you said. And he goes and tells everyone, God's going to judge the city unless we repent. God's going to judge the city. Other people started talking about it. God's going to judge the city. And they're hashtagging it on Twitter. God's judgment coming, 2018. They're all freaking out, hashtagging this. They're sharing it on Facebook. They're Snapchatting it. Instagram had a picture of a lightning bolt from heaven. They're all freaking out. And so they all the whole city gathered together in the town square. And they all decided to say, boy bands, out of here. We're replacing you with Third Day and DC Talk. And we're replacing you with Toby Mac and, and they got a big old band and then Hillsong showed up and they did a big praise fest and then God said great look at this great praise look at this glorious city I will not judge the city Jonah sees the revival that's happening he goes to the top of a cliff he sits there looks upon the city and he screams and cries and has a temper tantrum and he gets mad that they're not getting destroyed because it means the Ninevites are going to last another day and then it means that when he goes on to the new world and to everlasting glory he's going to have to spend it with them and that's not going to be heaven that's going to be hell for eternity to him and he's so mad and frustrated this is the story of Jonah isn't that such a great and uplifting story isn't that just awesome okay but that's exactly it so what happened was uh, Jonah spent three days where in the belly of a fish under the water okay so in a sense he was in a watery grave and so Jesus, using the story of Jonah, predicts his death for the first time in the book of Matthew. 
predicts his death, that he is going to die, be in the grave for three days, and as Jonah was vomited onto the land, so Jesus is going to be vomited uh, out of the grave. Okay, that that's what's going to happen. That is going to be that event. And Jesus said that when I rise again, that's going to prove it to everyone that I am who I say that I am. Okay, and that will be the only last sign that you guys are ever going to get. And then Jesus continues about how even these people, like Jonah, are going to judge the Pharisees of the day. And so Jesus continues on. He says, the men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation, and they will condemn it, which is interesting. Jesus is saying the wicked Ninevites are going to be the judge, if you will, to condemn a witness for the prosecution against the Jews of that day, against the generation of that day, and condemn it. For they, the Ninevites, repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. Okay, so if those people revent, repented from Jonah's message, and Jonah's a jerk, well, then someone who's not a jerk is here, and you guys are disobeying him and ignoring him. Jesus is greater than Jonah, and they're not listening to Jesus. He's like, so he's like, man, th these Ninevites figured it out with a jerk, and you guys can't figure it out with a great man. So what's wrong with you guys, with God in the flesh? You can't figure this out? And he continues, the queen of the south, Okay, the Queen Sheba, okay, Queen of the South, will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now something greater than Solomon is here. And so there again, Jesus says, hey, you know Solomon, that pervert? The guy who had like a thousand girlfriends? The guy who had like 700 uh, or 400 wives and 700 concubines? And, and most guys can't even handle one wife, let alone all these ladies. I mean, Samson, uh, uh, Solomon is one of those guys who, who when a woman came, his wife came to him to complain, he'd be like, you know what? I don't want to hear your complaining take. Go ahead and take a number. Try number 727. That sounds good. I'll see you then. And so he was just that type of, of a pervert guy. And the people sought his counsel even though he was a pervert, okay? And yet, here's someone greater than Solomon, who's not a pervert, is here, and people aren't paying attention. And it's amazing about this, because even today, when people don't believe Jesus is God, how do they talk about Jesus? That he was a good man, a good teacher. Even though they don't re admit his divinity, they still understand that he was a fantastic person, that he was extremely moral, above repute, above everything. He was just an amazing guy. And so they just, Jesus is just so confused. He is just absolutely confused about this. And so that's this whole Jesus whole setup. So how this looks for today how this looks for today is I wanted to be able to really be able to hammer out the fact that Jesus is absolutely God, and I wanted to try to take a different approach for you, a little different than what Jesus did, a little different than dealing with the resurrection. I want to deal with uh, trying to prove for you not only that Jesus is God, but that also the Bible, amongst every other religious text in the world, is the only true word of God. It is his revelation that we can trust the Bible and trust that Jesus is God. It seems like that's the big hubbub that people have today. How do we know we can trust the Bible? How do we know when so many other religions claim similar truths? How do we know that we know that? How do we know that Jesus is God, not just a great person? How do we know that we aren't just looking at a, a somebody that has been just magnified beyond their potential? How do we know we can trust Jesus versus anybody else's faults? gods how do we know that to be true and so i would like to answer those questions kind of in the way that jesus might do today with our generation based upon jesus's teaching here as well as who he is as an individual that means the messiah and what that means so let me just start with this first of all the bible was first written as the old testament and they did not have the New Testament when Jesus was walking the grounds of the earth because the New Testament was, well, happening. 
So they had the Old Testament. And the Old Testament was completed around 400 years before Jesus was born. Now, we don't have all the original documents of those. We have copies of the original documents because of fires and weathering and whatnot. All we have are copies of the original documents. Now, these copies are still hundreds of years before Jesus was ever born. We have some very old copies. We also know this, that the Old Testament was translated about 250 years to 260 years before Jesus was born into the Greek language. It's called the Septuagint. Okay, so about 250 to 260 years before Jesus was born, they took the completed Old Testament, translated it into the Greek language. That's likely the Bible Jesus read when he was a kid. And when Jesus walked the earth and taught in the temples was likely from the Septuagint. Okay, so 250 to 260 years before Jesus was born, we know that it was translated into Greek. And we have those, a lot of those original documents. Okay, so we know that the Bible, the Old Testament, is older than Jesus by at least 250 to 260 years, right? Because we know when it got translated to Greek, so it had to have been completed before then, okay? So I know it seems like academic trivial information, but bear with me. I'm just kind of building a, a puzzle together, okay? So that's just one of the key pieces. It's like the, the solid line frame around the end. Just want you to have in your mind that the Old Testament was completed hundreds of years before Jesus was born. Parts of it were written thousands of years before Jesus was ever born. Okay, but it was completed a minimum 250 years because you can't translate to Greek what doesn't exist. Right, that would just be silly. Okay, so that's what we do know very much about that. Now, the Old Testament gives predictions on who the Messiah is going to be. And it offers a lot of predictions. They're called messianic prophecies. A lot of, a lot of uh, prophecies are available predicting who the Messiah is going to be, about what's going to happen in the life of the Messiah, and how to tell the Messiah from anybody else. Josh McDowell made the shrewd observation uh, of comparing the mess messianic prophecies to a person's address. Have you ever thought about how unique your address is? I mean, think about it. I could be in Indianapolis. I could write a letter and mail it to any one of you, and odds are it will make it to you because it has your address on it, right? And if I were to move to Canada and mail you a letter from there, do you think it would get to you? Odds are, yes, it will get to you. Unless the post office screws up or unless somebody else messes up or unless it gets lost in the mail or whatever, odds are it's going to make it to you because your address is what makes you unique and different from the six billion other people in the world because no one else has your address. I know some of you are saying, well, my kids live with me. They share my address. Mm. It's still your address. We put your name, your address, and it gets to you. Okay, that's what's so neat about it. And so the messianic prophecies are like an address. Okay, it's like an address trying to zero in amongst all the millions and billions of people that have ever lived. How do we know who the one Messiah is amongst all of that? What's the address to be able to find this individual? If we were to look for a divine GPS that would tell us how to get to the Messiah and find out who that individual is, what would that address be to get us there? Okay, and that's what the Old Testament provides. Now, Josh McDowell says there's 333 Messianic prophecies. Uh, Carl Aiken and a few other uh, seminary professors have said there's actually 366 Messianic prophecies, you know, one for every day of the year, including leap year. And, and some of those, I look, I, I re I've researched all of them. I'm not, I'm not lying. And how would you guys like if I went through all 360 prophecies in like five minutes? Would that be fun? Yeah, not for me either. Okay, it wasn't even fun reading them all. That was just a lot of work. Some of them were duplicated. And, and so uh, what I do know is that Josh McDowell's number 333 seems to be unique, non-repetitive messianic prophecies. But some of the other ones would argue and complain, where's 360? And they get mad at Josh McDowell. So how about this? We'll just find a compromise playing ground. Let's just say there's over 300. Is that fair? 
You think everybody would be able to agree between Josh McDowell and all the other professors that the ones that say 333, 360, 366, 333, 360, 366. Well, I think we could all agree there's at least 300. Is that all right? Can I just say there's 300? Would you guys be offended at me if I said there's 300? You're not going to say I'm cutting stuff out of the Bible and call up a personnel review and, and, and criticize me for that and ask me to repent? Are we okay with 300? Guys are like, whatever, dude, just get on with it. Okay, uh, but okay, so there's 300 messianic prophecies. I want to go through these for you, not all 300. I want to do 20. I just want to do 20. And it's not going to be very long. I'm not going to take like an hour for this. I'm going to go very, very, very fast. Okay? It's so fast, you're going to forget half of what I say. And it's, I'm, it's on purpose. It's recorded. It's going to be on YouTube. I'm going to type up all these verses and these 20 onto our blog. You'll have them available to you on our website. You, you can have them. So you're not going to be able to write them all down. You're, you're going to get carpal tunnel. You're going to be like, ah, oh, my hand. Oh, cramp, cramp. Huh, I should have worn hander pants. Ha, ha, ha. Okay? And, and it, just, just... Don't worry about writing all these down. I will provide them for you uh, because there's going to be so many. I'm going to go quick at some point and I'm just going to rock through it because I want you to see the scope of this and how amazing this is. And I went to Josh McDowell's website because this is based off of his research and he has a little thing that you can fill out to have permission to use his material without being sued. So I got that. Isn't that exciting? So we aren't going to get sued today. Thank you. One person feels it. Thank you. We're not getting sued. That should be like a, we should all celebrate. Hallelujah. We're not getting sued today. You know, and that, that should just be glory for everybody here. That's just amazing. Okay. And so, uh, so here's kind of how this works off. This is, by the way, when you look at this, this is irrefutably the absolute number one best proof Jesus is God and the Bible is trustworthy in the history of humanity. And this is amazing. Absolutely amazing. So check this out. So the Bible starts off in the book of Genesis being able to try to tell us what the address is for the Messiah. And here's what it starts off with. It says, first off, in Genesis 3.15, that the Messiah will come from the seed of a woman. Now, you might say, doesn't that mean he's being born of a woman? Yeah, yeah, it means he's going to be born. So isn't that exciting? We know he's going to be a human being. Okay, we know that he's going to come in the form of a human being. That's what's going to happen. So he's going to be born of a seed of a woman. This is unique because usually in the Bible, in fact, 99% of the time in the Bible, when it says that someone is born, who begets the person? The man. It's always the son of, repeatedly and repeatedly, the son of this and the son of that and so-and-so uh, begot so-and-so and this guy begot this child and that child begot this child and on and on it goes. The only time women are ever used in the genealogy like that as far as having the children is if there's more than one wife from the same guy and you got to figure out which woman is coming from. Okay, or if there's something very particularly unique about that woman. Otherwise, always it's from the seed of the man that, that the genealogy comes from. But it starts off at the very beginning with Adam and Eve. God says it's going to come from the seed of a woman, which you might be like, why do that? To show you this person's unique. It's not just going to be any individual. So pay attention to this genealogy. It's not going to be like anybody else's. So it comes from the seed of a woman, Genesis 3.15. And then it's going to come from the line of Shem. Okay, because after Noah, when the flood happened, all the people died. So you got a limited gene pool at that point. Right? And so Noah has several kids that are with him. And so God cuts out 75% of the options here and says it's going to come from the line of Shem. So it's going to come from the seed of a woman in the line of Shem, Genesis chapter 9. And the Messiah will also be a descendant of Abraham. So of all the children that are done, all the children that are born, it's, not, it's just not going to be from any of, of Shem's family line. He narrows it down to the life of Abraham, Genesis 12, verse 3. And then also from the line of Isaac, because Abraham did didn't just have a one child. He didn't just have two either. It's not just Isaac and Ishmael. He had eight. Most people don't know that because they don't read Genesis very thoroughly. And so he had multiple kids, okay? And so God cuts out seven-eighths of the possibility. So God is saying that he comes from the seed of the woman, the line of Shem, the descendants of Abraham, through the line of Isaac, 
Okay, so, so it's gonna be from the line of Isaac. So we're gonna to have to look at that family line because God's cutting out the seven eighths of the other possibilities. And of all of Isaac's children, it's gonna be from the descendants of Jacob. Okay, so all the kids that Isaac has, Jacob's gonna be the one that the Messiah is going to come from. And Jacob later gets his name changed to, Trivia Pursuit, Trivia Pursuit. Jacob's name gets changed to Israel. Yeah, somebody said it, they were just shy. Yeah, that's right, Israel. Say that with gusto, Israel. Yeah, he gets his name changed to Israel. And he has how many sons? 12, okay, 12. And those become the 12 tribes of Israel. The father of those 12 sons are named, of the, all the tribes are named from those 12 kids. Okay, now, so what happens here is that God takes the descendants of Jacob and eliminates 11 twelfths of the Jews that the Messiah can come from. He eliminates 11 of the 12 tribes and says, hey, he's gonna come from just one tribe and that's gonna be the tribe of Judah, Genesis 49, verse 10. Okay, so we got the seed of the woman, the line of Shem, the descendants of Abraham, the line of Isaac, from the descendants of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, and then also from the family of Jesse because you know, Judah has lots of kids. And so he eliminates all of those and zeroes it in. You see how this is getting very specific now. Like an address, this is getting very, very specific. God is zeroing it in for us from the line of Jesse and from the house of David. Because Jesse has lots of kids, one of which is David, and so it's gonna come from the house of David. So we got from the seed of the woman, the line of Shem, the descendants of Abraham, the line of Isaac, and the descendants of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, and the family of Jesse, and the house of David. Second Samuel chapter 12, uh, 7, verse 12. Okay, and you would think that, wow, this is getting extremely specific. Surely God would do this even beyond this whole idea uh, of, even, of even households. And, and you're right, he absolutely does. He says that he, the Messiah will be crucified, book of Psalms, chapter two, verses seven through eight. And here's what's weird about this. Crucifixion didn't even exist yet. Hanging people on a tree did not happen yet. The closest it came was uh, started with the Persians, like in the book of Esther, where they did impaling, where they take a, a, a big old pole, they stick it up the rear end and out the other end, and they hang them that way. I know it's gruesome, right? And then later, they end up hanging them on a wall. It's not until the Romans that they started putting people on a tree, and even then it was done by ropes, not nails. And yet Psalms, well before the Romans were ever in existence, says that the Messiah will be nailed to a tree. Okay, and so this is predicting a practice that hasn't even been invented yet, and yet there it is. He's giving us specifics. So not only do we get the seed of the woman, the line of Shem, the descendant of Abraham, the line of Isaac, and the descendants of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, and the family of Jesse, and the house of David, that he will also be crucified, nailed to a tree, and that he will even be born in Bethlehem. Isn't that awesome that he will be born in Bethlehem? And Bethlehem's like a no-place town. It's like, it's, like telling, it's like saying that he's going to be born in, in, in Ridge Ripple, Indiana. You're like, where? Yeah, exactly. It's up by Fort Wayne. Okay, but if, <laughs> exactly. You know, actually, no, that's not up by Fort Wayne. Uh, Ridge Ripple is actually is in Marion County, north of Indianapolis, by about 40 minutes. I was looking at a different city up there, uh, and I changed my mind to, to this one. But born in Bethlehem. So is this is just really bizarre that he even picks the town that Jesus will be born in. So not only does he have to be in this line of the woman, in the seed of the line of Shem, the descendants of Abraham, the line of Isaac, the descendants of Jacob, the tribe of Judah, from the family of Jesse, and the house of David, not only does he have to be nailed by, to, a, to a tree to be crucified, but also will come from a very particular, unique town with a population of like 200. Okay, so this is getting very, very specific. And even here now, I've like run out of space on my screen and I haven't even gone through all of them yet. There's a lot more, so check this out. It also says that in Isaiah 53 that the Messiah will be despised, rejected, and killed uh, for, for, his, for, for being who he is. So he's gonna be despised, rejected, and killed. And then we also get in Psalm 41, 9 that the Messiah will be betrayed by a friend. Okay, so not only is he gonna be despised, he's gonna be betrayed, but not just by anybody, by a friend friend, right, Judas Iscariot, anybody, and then also that he is going to be betrayed, and Zechariah 11, verses 10 through 13, betrayed for 30, not 29, pieces of silver, not gold, and that and, uh, those pieces of silver will be thrown, not placed, onto the temple floor, not in the market, and not on a table. 
Okay, so you see all how specific this is, right down to the type of coin, right down to how it's being thrown, right down to the number of coins, 30, not anything else, and that that silver will be regathered and used to purchase a field. Okay, Zechariah 11, 13. And then Isaiah 53, 9, will bear be, that will be purchasing that field and that it will be buried, Jesus will be buried, or the Messiah will be buried in a rich man's tomb. Isaiah 25, 8, that he will rise from the dead. Psalm 68, 18, that he will ascend into the heavens. Psalm 110, verse 1, he will be seated at the right hand of the Father. Okay, now that's 19 so far that we've gotten through. <laughs> you might think as specific as God is being about this address, surely he would tell us when this would happen. He did. You're like, what? He told us when? Well, he gave us a time period. Okay, he gave us a time period, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1, that this will all take place before the temple is destroyed because the Messiah, Malachi 3, 1 says the Messiah will do ministry in the temple. And the temple was destroyed by the Romans in 70 A.D. Okay, so therefore, anybody claiming to be the Messiah post-70 A.D. is a liar that doesn't know their Bible. Because they can't do ministry in the temple because it's not standing. The only thing remaining of the temple right now in Israel is the western wall sitting up, leaning with little posts sticking it up. If it weren't for those posts, it would be laying down too. It is just a destroyed temple. There's nothing left. Okay, so that's just 20 of the 300 prophecies. Not just genealogy issues and what family and what person and what person and what person, but also the city. Also, how he's going to be betrayed, the amount of money, how the money's going to be used, that he's going to be crucified, and that he is going to come from this small little town, and that it's all going to happen prior to the destruction of the temple. It's going to have to happen all before 70 AD takes place. Now, this, like, this is just 20 of them. Now, to try to help us understand what this means and why this is so significant and not just academic jargon that's useless for everything. Why, how to wrap our brains around this, uh, Josh McDowell got himself together some statisticians. You guys like numbers, right? Now, some of you do. You used to be accountants. Some of you, uh, you, you, you know, some of you are math teachers. God forgive you. And, and, and that's just wonderful. And so uh, <laughs> let me just share with you, I love statistics. I check out the box office reports and Nielsen ratings every day, every day. I wake up and I check those out. I love statistics. I love numbers. Let me just share with you some of the findings of this, of the statisticians, okay? Here's what they discovered. They discovered this, that for one individual, for one individual to fulfill eight of the prophecies, just eight, okay, the odds of that happening are one to 10 to the 17th power. Okay, one to 10 to the 17th power. That looks a little bit something like this. Okay, quintillion. Would you like those odds for the lottery? Okay, this is what's fascinating about this, and that is that Richard Dawkins, big professional atheist, okay, he wrote a book called The God Delusion, tried to mathematically prove that God did not exist and that the existence of God was mathematically impossible. The mathematical equation he used was of his own creation. He made it up and he wrote all those numbers out and he got all done. He came up with the number and said the odds of God existing are one in, and it was a number half this number. And he said, therefore, this is proof that God cannot exist as mathematically impossible and he's like the second smartest man in the face of the earth hold the chair of science at Oxford University okay so very smart man I will give him that he's wrong about God but very smart man okay and he used a number half this size to make it mathematically impossible what would you call a number of odds twice as difficult okay impossible and that was how many prophecies it was only eight Jesus, by the way, fulfilled over 300. Let your brain wrap around that. Here's another way of looking at what this looks like. Let's say you were to take the state of Texas and you were to fill the state of Texas two feet deep with half dollars. Okay, from north to south, east to west, all the way along the borderline, the entire state of Texas, two feet deep, stacked with half dollars. Then you take one additional half dollar and you mark it in some way. And you take a little plane and you fly over the state of Texas. And randomly at any point over the state of Texas, you throw that coin out the window into the state of Texas. 
Then you take a bulldozer just for fun. You mix it all up. Then you take a man from El Paso, let's say, and you blindfold him and tell him, pick any coin you want. Wander the entire state of Texas two feet deep and reach down and pick up any coin you want. The odds of him picking up that one coin that you marked is the same odds of one person fulfilling eight prophecies. Eight. Jesus fulfilled how many? Over 300. Over three. You want to call that impossible? If just eight is considered beyond impossible, what's 300? We don't even have a number. They couldn't even do the math big enough for that. Could, that's why they did it with eight, because that was as far as they could go without the computers at the time just going, you suck. I'm not doing this. I crash. <laughs> okay, it is just beyond. To, for this to happen would be an act of God. And yet what we find is that Jesus was born. Nobody disputes the birth of Jesus. Nobody disputes the existence of Jesus. Their only question is, was he God or not? And what we do know from Jesus' genealogy, what we do know about Jesus' birth, what we do know about his being despised and rejected, betrayed by a friend, crucified by nails onto for crucifixion, and that we do know that he was betrayed for 30 pieces, not 29, pieces of silver, not gold, and that those coins were thrown on the floor, not tossed onto a table or placed into a market, and that those were regathered up to purchase a field for Jesus to be buried in, that that field belonged to a rich man. That's what we do know about Jesus. That is undisputed by any academic of any clout of historian. We know all of that to be absolutely 100% true. Even without talking about the resurrection and ascension, Jesus already has fulfilled over 12 of those prophecies. Without even talking about ascension and resurrection. He, in fact, if we just took those two out, we got 18, not eight. Already we know. And people can say, well, how do we know they didn't write the Bible after Jesus was born to make it fit? Because we talked about to begin with, the Bible was written when? 400 to thousands of years before he was ever born. And we know this for a fact because of how it was translated into Greek 250 to 260 years before he was born. Even before the Romans were even doing the crucifixion, it was translated into Greek. Do you get this? This is what makes this amazing. How we know Jesus is God and how we know the Bible is true. This is how we know we can trust it because no other text can do that. For to be able to do that would be a miracle. <gasps> exactly what Jesus is. A miracle. An absolute bona fide miracle that Jesus is the Messiah. And this is so important because we live in a country that longs for a Messiah. You might say, no, we don't. We live in a fairly secular country. Yeah, they're looking for a secular Messiah. Check this out. The people keep saying, if we vote so-and-so into presidency, that will save our country. See, Messiah. If we get somebody out of the presidency, that will save our country. Messiah. If we just get first draft in the NFL pick, that will save our team. Messiah. If we could just elect so-and-so as governor, they're even a veteran. Messiah. All over the, if I could just find someone that loves me, that doesn't have to love me, that guy or that girl, that boyfriend or that girlfriend, and if they could, my mom has to love me, but someone that would really love me, that will make me feel special. That will save my life, Messiah. Our country longs for a Messiah. And the problem with all those Messiahs is that they're false Messiahs because they will all let you down. I'm sure we have all voted for someone into office just to be let down afterwards. I'm sure we have all hoped that our team would get a new coach just to be let down afterwards. I'm sure we all have had a new boss come in that we thought would just change our company just to be let down afterwards. I'm sure we all have dated someone just to be let down afterwards, even after marrying them. They have let us down. 
Every single person married has been let down by their spouse at least once today. <laughs> okay, we, uh, we, are, we hunt for messiahs all the time, but they're all false messiahs. Jesus is the only true messiah that will not let you down. He is the only legitimate Messiah that will not let you down. He is the perfect, holy God in the flesh. That's who Jesus is. And we can try making Messiahs out of laws all we want. We can try to say, hey, we got violence. Let's go ahead and put more laws on guns. Keep in mind, take away all the guns. Cain still killed Abel with a rock. What we need are not more laws. What we need are change hearts. And who changes hearts? The Messiah, Jesus. We can say that there's racism problems all over our country. What we need is better education. Keep in mind, in the end, merely education will not be enough because we're still going to screw it up and have racial problems. What we need is change of heart. And who's going to change the heart? The Messiah, Jesus. We can say that there's issues with domestic violence and we got to be able to deal with this laws and this practice and why we got to do better at all those things. In the end, the ultimate restoration is going to come from changed hearts. Who's going to change the heart? Laws and regulations or social workers? No, the Messiah. That's who we need to be looking for is the true Messiah, and that is Jesus. That is why we say Jesus is the answer. It's not some churchy answer. It's not some platitude, placid answer. It is the answer because only Jesus changes hearts, and heart change is the only thing that's going to fix the problems in our country today. It is the only thing that's going to help heal our country today, and it's the only thing that's going to help bring restoration to our country today, and that's coming from one place, the Messiah, and we know that's Jesus because of the fulfillment of the prophecies and from the testimony of God's word that is 100% refutable, so refutable that even the staunchest atheist looks at these prophecies, scratch their heads and goes, I don't know. That's what this is. That's who we serve is this Jesus Messiah. Let us all stand here together today and get on our feet. And we're going to sing now. Let's get our team praise up here. And we're going to be able to sing out to this Messiah that this Jesus, this Messiah is who we long for. We long for him more than anyone else. It is Jesus Messiah. Let's all stand here and sing together, Jesus Messiah.